Well, we just started a, a new series for the summer. Um, it's a refresher series in a lot of ways on those nine qualities of character that the Apostle Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5.22. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And today we begin with love, and I will mention that I do plan to come back to love in the final sermon of the series, because I think it functions, as Paul notes in his shorter list of spirit different qualities, that it's the one that ties everything else together. You know, Colossians 3.14, we read it last week. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now, some topics are hard to preach because there isn't much information on them. Others are hard because there's too much. In the NIV, uh, words translated love show up 787 times. I don't think there is a single topic that has been written about, sung about, discussed more in the whole sum of all human experience than love. But at the same time, we realize that our impoverished English word love sometimes covers so much ground that it's almost impossible to know what we mean by it when we say it. I mean, friends, think about it. In our English language, the word love can be applied with ease to pizza, the Seahawks, your child, or God. That broad spectrum makes the word by itself almost meaningless. A, a lot of languages uh, have multiple words for various kinds of love and affection. And in many ways, the English language is poor for our singular word. I, I suspect that many of you have heard many sermons on love. I now know that Greek has four words that are commonly used for love. They're more than that, but those are the four main ones. Each normally carries with it a more narrow meaning than our very generic word. Um, the first one, we kind of know it's eros. It's often used for, usually used for physical, romantic love, uh, you know, a, a more sexual love. Uh, by the time of the New Testament, it always carries a somewhat a negative connotation. Uh, in some places could really be translated lust. Um, and probably because of that, it's actually not found in the New Testament. Uh, you know, we get erotic from that word. So it's a word we know of. There's another word, uh, uh, philia. Uh, and that's actually a very common word for friendship. Uh, and, and that kind of less sexual side of human love. It's the Greek's broadest word for love. You know, Philadelphia, the, the city of brotherly love. When Lazarus is dying, we read in the Gospel of John, so then the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one who you love, Philio, Philio, is sick. And frankly, it can occasionally, in rare occasions, be used uh, for the love of God itself. John 16, 27. No, the Father himself loves, Philia, you, because you have loved me and you believe that I came from God. Even so, in all those references, it, it only shows up 26 times in the New Testament. Now, there's another word you don't talk about much, storge. I think I'm mispronouncing that, but it's close. Um, it was a word for family affection, the love of a child, love of a parent. It actually doesn't make it into the New Testament either, except in the negative a couple times. Um, remember that word, because we're going to come back to it, though. Finally, there is that word uh, that we all know, uh, agapon or agapo or agape, depending on what how you're using it. Um, the, the Greek word agapon is used 130. 43 times in the New Testament, 284 in the what we call the Septuagint. That was the Greek, a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, it's actually very rare in classical Greek literature. By New Testament times, it is more commonly used and more broadly used for love in various contexts. Um, and even in the New Testament, uh, it can be used for a rather common kind of love. You know, Luke 11:43, uh, Woe to you Pharisees, because you love agapon, uh, the most important seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. However, Christian writers tend to use agapon in a unique way. As I said in our children's sermon, it is a love that creates value in something because it is loved. It is a love called out of a person's heart by an awakened sense of value in an object which causes one to prize it. Let me give you a, a, a perfect example from my point of view. Um, when my first, our first daughter, Alicia, was born, she immediately latched on to a very old European-style flannel diaper that came from my mother-in-law that we were using as a little blanket to be her comfort item. Blanky was her constant companion. Normally, she would not go to sleep without it. 
the only picture I had of it there, you know, it was in a little, little bit of it sticking out there. And, and often, if we didn't have it uh, available, we had to frantically search for it. Um, eventually, it tattered into about a six-inch square. Life was thrown into crisis. It was lost in a motel and, and mailed back to us from there. Or when it was thrown away by a one-time house cleaner, we dug through the trash to find it. Um, it was as worthless as anything could be. But because she loved it, it became one of the most valuable items in our house. Think of agape that way. A love that creates value in the person that is loved. And, and this is where I think Jesus adds something so totally unique to our understanding of this most basic human need. You know, we tend to think of love as an emotion or a feeling. Well, that's an adjective. I feel love. Uh, or love is a verb, something we do. Uh, but still more of an emotion than an action. You know, I love my child, right? But Jesus tells us that love is often a noun, perhaps even better understood as a noun. Agapon becomes the noun agape, agape, 114 times in the New Testament. And agape as a noun is almost exclusively a New Testament invention. It tends to speak of a love that is brought forth and nourished by God. It, it is almost the thing in its own right. What are we told in Corinthians? Do everything in agape, love. Now that's radical because in first century Greek philosophy, love is something you give only to those who deserve it. If you want to be loved, you have to be lovable. To have, you have to deserve love, you don't just get it. And, and this is the kind of love, agape, that's associated with what Jesus taught, how we defined love, and what early Christians experienced that ultimately it was so powerful and so important, it actually sort of becomes a reality test of someone's faith. No one talks about love more than the Apostle John. He uses agape 46 times just in his, his first um, chapter, uh, his first, uh, le uh, in his letter that we call 1 John. 116 times totally in his writing. Let me just read you one section out of that. It's our main scripture this morning. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and anyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that he sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now remember, I started this series by saying that there are generally three things uh, that you look for, to, at least I look for, to see if someone really is a Christian. Uh, first, that they identify personally as a Christian, that they adhere to a select but important set of foundational uh, beliefs and truths about God. But finally, that you see the fruit of the Spirit in their lives, of which love is uniquely important. John seems to agree. In fact, he goes so far to say that if you don't love, if you don't have that agape love in your life, then you actually don't know God. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. That's, that's a pretty radical statement, isn't it? But immediately after that, he says something that qualifies and defines that love. He says, verse 9, In this love, God was made manifest among us that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. So this love that, that John is talking about is not some mushy sentimentality, not a love based on feelings. It's a love rooted in God's gift of a son to us and the death of his son for our sins. Note the next line, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but he loved us, and I say that a lot in our confession of sin, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. See how this love that creates value where there is no value is so important. God doesn't love us because we love him. Actually, it's quite the opposite. God loves us when he had no reason to love us as rebellious sinners. And yet God, even then, valued us enough, created value because of he loved us, to send his son to die for us. By the way, let me just say as a side note, when we read scripture verse, 
we often read past a word we don't know. And I will say that because of that, we, we often miss something important. How many of you can honestly tell me that you know what propitiation means? Yeah, Jay, that's not right. That's unfair. You know, let me tell you, this is why reading the Bible with a good study Bible is so important. Because if you're just reading through this, the regular Bible, you're not going to stop and grab a concordance or something and figure it out. A good study Bible, that information is usually right next to the text. The, in English, propitiation is a generic word for an act that appeases a God or appeases a person. Now, the New Testament, uh, we tend to use that in an English translation uh, to Greek words related to helastomos or helasteron. The root of that word means covering. But basically in the Bible, it refers to the cover and the Ark of the Covenant, or in the Jewish Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, uh, the blood of a sacrificial animal was poured over the ark to symbolically cover the sins of God's people. In the New Testament, it is used to describe the sacrifice of Christ's blood to cover our sins before God. The greatest act that defines love is God's love in Christ for us as he died for sinners like us. So don't miss that. That's really important. In fact, um, someone asked a truly brilliant the Reformed theologian, J.I. Packer, to sum up the gospel in three words. And the guy's such a nerd. You know what he says? He says, adoption through propitiation. And then he says, I do not expect to ever meet a richer or more pregnant summary of the gospel than that. Only the British can write like that. <laughs> and get away with it. So when you read the fruit of the Spirit and you see love, don't think of the mushy, sentimental love of our human relationships. Not that there's anything wrong with that in the right place. But think of the sacrificial love of God in Christ. A love that creates a value where it wasn't before. A love that we learn about from seeing how God has loved us. That's what we talk about when we talk about love. Now let me finish this morning with a totally unrelated thought on our country's Independence Day. Is it okay to love your country? My answer is yes, but with some big qualifications. Remember our four Greek words for love and the one that didn't make it into the New Testament except in a negative form. Storge, right? Storge is a love that refers to natural or instinctual affections, like the love of a parent towards their offspring or vice versa. It isn't agape love, but it's wonderful too, just to a lesser degree. Storge was a word that you would use when you talked about your love for your city or your city state or your country. You tended to love your country if there was something lovable about it, or quite frankly, just out of the sometimes sinful affiliation we all have with our own tribe, because we tend to live in this, you know, the mindset of an us versus them world. So we love our tribe, whether it ha we have any reason to or not. I think it is okay to love our country for the great nation that she is, for the good she has done, her great history of leadership and sacrifice, and the privileges and freedom we have as citizens of this country. We are truly best to live here. America is worthy of our appreciation. That is not to say we are perfect or that we do not have deep flaws. Lately, we have been reminded that our quest towards the New Testament ideal of a society without racial divisions and inequity is far from complete. And it's okay to love your country, but also work to mend our every flaw. And constructive criticism of our flaws does not negate our love for her. And Christians must be especially careful not to worship country on the same level that we love and worship God. Storge, not agape. There are too many Christians that have so commingled the love of God with the love of country that the two have become inseparate. And that's wrong. John also said that in his first letter. He warns us, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we need to keep that balance. I do love the United States. I feel blessed and privileged to live here. And there was nowhere else I would choose to live except maybe for the last couple of weeks in Antarctica. It will fill my heart to sing America the Beautiful as we close the service today. And I will honestly mean every verse. And I would die for her if I was called to do so. 
but this world is not my true home. My true citizenship is in the kingdom of God. I, I need to keep that in perspective. So friends, feel free to love both God and country, but with the right kind of love. And be careful not to put the earthly one before the eternal one. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have loved us with a love that created value where, where none existed. That, that you have taken us as, 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 as sinners who have turned our backs on you and turned us into this beloved prize for which Christ died. And, and we are so, so grateful for, for you making us what we are. Help us to, to show that love in our life to the, our brothers and sisters in Christ, to all of those around us. Um, help that love uh, reflect upon the love we have for our country, that we might love what it is and what it has done in her great heritage and also love her enough to want to help make her even better. But Lord, we thank you for the love that you show us in each and every place. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, there are few songs that I love to sing in church with an organ than America the Beautiful. And you will have it on the screen. You'll also see that it is listed in the, uh, in the bulletin. Uh, so you can follow the hymn if you want. Let us rise and sing what is really a hymn for our closing song this morning. that song. It should be our national anthem. Friends, go from this place 
May God shed his grace on this country as he has done for so long. And may we rejoice within it and make her greater because of the love that we have for each other and for all in Christ our Lord. Go, friends, in Christ's peace. Amen.